So I'm author of literature uh, while I'm working for IBM, which is all about innovation, innovation in quantitative finance, innovation in regulation, the innovation in technology, the fintech innovation. And the last one is innovation in economic theory. This is uh, a forum on economics whose uh, title is also inclusiveness. So what I want to do with you is basically to start with uh, economic theory. We conclude with inclusiveness and in the between we will discuss a bit about uh, regulation and technology. So why do we have a global financial crisis? Everybody might have his own opinion. I want to share with you the opinion of Alan Grispan, the former chairman of uh, the US uh, Federal Reserve, when uh, after the default of Lehman Brothers, he was asked by the US Congress to explain what the global financial crisis that just started was all about. We listened to Alan Grispan. Well, where do you think you made a mistake then? I made a mistake in presuming that the self-interest of organizations, specifically banks and others, was such as that they were best capable of protecting their own shareholders and their equity in the firms and now our whole economy is paying its price. Do you feel that your ideology pushed you to make decisions that you wish you had not made? Well, remember that what an ideology is, is a conceptual framework with the way people deal with reality. Everyone has one. You have to, you, to exist, you need an ideology. The question is whether it is accurate or not. And what I'm saying to you is yes, I found a flaw I don't know how significant or permanent it is, but I've been very distressed by that fact. But if I may, may I just finish an answer to the, the question previously? You, you found this, a flaw in a, a the flaw, reality? A flaw in the model that I perceived is the critical functioning structure that defines how the world works, so to speak. In other words, you found that your, your view of the world, your ideology was not Right, it was that, not that, working. It had a, that, precisely, no, I, that's precisely the reason I was shocked because I've been going for 40 years or more with very considerable evidence that it was working exceptionally well. So I wanted to start from here because Alan Grisman said, I found a flaw in the model which has built economic theory after the Second World War. Now, the global financial crisis created a, a big conundrum for financial institutions because the cost income is not uh, sustainable any longer and financial services need to transform. So what was the response of the industry? Well, three things happen. One is behavioral finance, the second one is monetary policy, and the third one is regulation and the business model. Now, I believe that if you understand that, we know how through transparency, we can digitize knowledge to scale the competence and transform financial services for the benefit of our society. So we start from behavioral finance. Now, Alan Grispan said, uh, well, the agents, the investors, uh, were not rational. That doesn't necessarily mean that they were irrational, but the common belief is that if you're not rational, you are irrational. And that's when behavioral finance became uh, very fashionable. You know that Richard Taylor got the Nobel Prize last year for behavioral finance because he says that if you nudge someone that is irrational, it goes back to become rational again. But there is a problem with this model. The problem is that it might not necessarily work right at the time when you need it. You can think about the retirement crisis and what has happened in Australia. The Australians were the first to create superannuation funds, basically to super nudge individuals to save a lot for retirement, making sure that they would have enough money because government would not be capable of paying for everybody. What happened though is that in 2014-15, when the first baby boomers started retiring, instead of taking the money and buying products like annuities, well, it was actually difficult because the interest rates were very low and the equity market was not performing, so they were actually very expensive products. Most of them took the money and they went on vacation. So the Australians had to realize that nudging or creating incentives is not enough if you don't make sure that this becomes a behavior. Therefore, we need to start with a concept of reality, which is the real opponent of the concept of rationality. And why do we need to start from this one? Because only by understanding how the Homo sapiens works when he has to confront with uncertainty, we understand the way people make financial decisions or other decisions in the economy and in the political system. You know we are born because we need to basically love, we need to work, we need to have children, we need to survive until we die. In our life, we need to face uncertainty continuously. 
and we need to find a way to do that. But what happens is that we are used in the capitalistic system to believe that uncertainty can be somehow controlled because we had an economic drift after the Second World War. But Paul Krugman, in the 1990s, Nobel Prize for Economics, wrote a book called The Age of Diminished Expectations, where basically said that the children of the American families will have less opportunities than their parents to make more money. Therefore, the drift in the economy will be negative. And this will create what he said, uncertainty, therefore, social unrest. We can call it the Brexit, we can call it the transformation of sovereignism, populism, we can call it the gilets jaunes. So we are actually seeing it today, the fact that since uncertainty becomes relevant to the individuals, the individuals change their behavior. So we don't understand anymore in economics if people and companies and organizations are rational or irrational. In reality, they are simply human. It's just the reality of how humans react when uncertainty becomes too large for them to cope with. Now, what is the second issue here? The second issue is therefore monetary policy. So on the one side, we thought maybe behavioral finance, we know it doesn't work that well. The other side is we tried to save the system by using the quantitative easing. You remember Mario Draghi with whatever it takes? Within our mandate, within our mandate, the ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. And believe me, it will be enough. So the ECB has been challenged continuously for the last 10 years to save basically the system, or a bit less given that the Federal crisis started in 2011. This has also consequences. Uh, at, the global, uh, at the World Economic Forum, uh, in a conversation among the CEOs, I remember the CEO of UBS said that there is a problem with the quantitative easing, right? Because the interest rates are so low, it's difficult for banks to operate on the credit side and to make money after the price of risk, which continuously creates a credit crunch in the economy. But my point here is that the monetary policy was only used to allow the financial system time to breathe and to restructure itself because it had to go through a transformation, a change of the business model, to make sure that it could become more sustainable. But here is another gap in the problem, and a gap in the theory. The quantitative easing is also accompanied by the idea of stability. And stability is not the same concept of anti-fragility. I know that we don't have the time to discuss this concept today. I hope that you will have the time to read some inside the literature. But the point is that the too big to fail might create a problem because the dinosaurs themselves were not too big to fail. So the financial system is at the risk of creating a further and bigger collapse the moment the quantitative easing stops and basically is taken away from the economy. So something else is happening. The European Commission, which I believe was aware of all these aspects, thought about something else. They said, well, we actually start mutualizing the system input through regulation, which is based on transparency. You can think of the PSD2, that means opening the information of clients so that we can create different services in front of the individuals. Or you can think of the MIFID2, which is totally based on transparency, which is the idea of revealing the potential conflict of interest of financial institutions in a way that the regulation of the system changes and makes the system more resilient and more anti-fragile. Now, I've been engaging a few of these people through different conversations, and I want to report only those which are public. The first one is Frédéric Courier, the CEO of uh, Société Générale. Talking together at Paris FinTech Forum two years ago, he said, you see, the real transformation of financial services these days after the global financial crisis is a change from transactions to services, which, in my language, means Instead of selling products with embedded fees, through transparency, packaging those products in a mechanism called advice that the clients are happy to pay for transparently. The problem is that Sophia Merlot, the co-chief executive officer of MP Revival Management, she spoke after us, said, we have asked the French clients if they want to pay for services. And they said, pas du tout, <laughs> that means no way because they might have a hard time in understanding the value of the banking proposition. But she said, we want to do that because it has to be in our DNA, and we know that the MIFID II is asking us to go through this transformation. I skip Larry Fink or BlackRock, but basically the transformation is occurring also in the US, not just in Europe. So now the point here is that the FinTech revolution is exactly the opportunity to help 
the financial institutions to go through this transformation from transactions to services in a marketplace that due to regulation is becoming more and more transparent. And transparency to become value added to generate return on investment when it comes to digital requires to generate value for the investors the investors or the client of the bank, which now takes center stage. That's a Copernican revolution. The financial product is not anymore at the center of the economic action of banks. The client becomes the center of the economic action of banks because he will have to pay directly for those services. So then we need to understand what is value in this relationship. This is Gene Rometti, the CEO of IBM, last year, I think 2018 in Las Vegas. She was interviewing Dave McKay, the CEO of Royal Bank of Canada. And she asked Dave a simple question. She said, Dave, what is the value of digital in a transparent market? Trying to create value not only for customers, but for our employees who serve those customers, bringing mobility, bringing advice, bringing insight into data, yeah. knowledge, value. And that's the equation Th that we're trying to... So you see, knowledge is value, and that's why if you followed me through the years in my top leadership in IBM, you will recognize that the late motive of most of my presentation here in Greece as well is the digitization of knowledge. Because knowledge is what is transferred from a financial institution to his client to enable his client to take transparently decisions for his personal life, being that client an individual or a small and medium enterprise. But now I thought that we needed to add something else to this concept of the digitization of knowledge, which is basically at the core of this new book, Financial Market Transparency. There is the concept of holistic behavioral awareness. Because we need to make sure that everything that happens becomes resilient in the society. Because we cannot just make people responsible to make decisions because there is the MIFI 2, because there is a questionnaire. We also need to make sure that people learn and understand how to relate with the financial problem and uncertainty because they're very difficult concepts to deal with. And that is therefore the reason why I believe that only transparency, when it's at the heart of the design of digital platforms and the transformation of financial services, enables to create this value that is a value transferred to the individuals because the individuals are made empowered to understand how to deal with a financial problem. And this is the only way to create inclusiveness, to make sure that we can also use artificial intelligence and digital technology to reskill people, to reskill the bankers, because also the bankers will have to change in this transformation from transactions to services. I want to conclude the listening to Gina Rometti again, the CEO of IBM. She was at the World Economic Forum a few weeks ago in a panel with other CEOs uh, talking about inclusiveness, which is uh, the title of uh, the Delphi Economic Forum. Let's listen to what she said a couple of seconds. With the new technologies that are out there, I think there is a huge inclusion problem, meaning there's a mm. large part of society does not feel that this is going to be good for their future. Forget about whether it is or it isn't or what we believe, and that therefore they feel very disenfranchised. And it's what led to Brexit. It's what <sighs> led to all of this, that you've got to make it inclusive, which means you have to believe in some different things, I believe, mm. to go forward now. So, so you see, regulatory transparency is changing the business model of banks from a channel distribution of products into a packaging mechanism of advice. In order to make sure that this is valuable for the banks and for the clients, we need to change the mindset. It is required to have a mindset shift. The US President Abraham Lincoln in 1862, one month before signing the Declaration of Rights that freed the slaves, said that the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew which is the reason why, after having discussed innovation in quantitative finance, innovation in regulation, innovation in fintech, I decided to add this piece, which is innovation in economic theory, because transparency is the element that can turn change into progress, because it helps people to understand, and it creates trust against global uncertainty, which is always on the rise. I was at the European Banking Authority two days ago, discussing artificial intelligence, and the whole topic was how we can make sure, and we want to make sure, that AI is not a black box, but it is robust, it is reliable, it is understandable, it is ethical, it is not biased. So this is our mission for you in the digital economy. Thank you.
Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ τον κύριο Σιρόνι. Thank you very much, indeed, Mr. Σιρόνι.